Hello. How are you? Good. Okay. Thank you for joining me today to see and learn. Well, I'm going to learn why Europe is insanely well designed by OBF. Go check out this channel. Oh my gosh, almost 3 million views. Wow. Well, you can see right here that they, they apparently, it looks like they have lamp posts just perfectly spaced apart from each other all throughout the whole continent. So that must be why. This is a map of Europe's mass transit railway system across oh. 33 countries. The yellow lines indicate the presence of a train line. And as you can see, it's very dense. There are hardly any spaces where there isn't any coverage for railways. Now, if we compare this to a map of railroad tracks in the US, it's a different story. That's pretty crap. That's pretty crap, huh? Yeah, they all just go... Where to Chicago? Sorry. While parts of the US have some yeah. good mass transit, there are large areas of the country which isn't covered by Amtrak, the nation's largest passenger rail... Ours looks like a spider? And your guys' looks like a spider web. <laughs> Quote of the day. Right, Road service. But let me show you another map by Amtrak, the nation's largest passenger railroad service. But let me show you another map, this time of high speed rail in Europe. Now, obviously, high speed railways aren't going to be as common as 300 kilometers an hour. Well, wow. regular speed railways, as they require excellent design, strict planning, and massive investment. Mm. And yet, as we can see, high speed rail is present in Europe, which is a stark contrast to the US, as you can see from this map. While the US does have some higher speed rail, I didn't even know we had any. How, how fast do these go? Because those one went up to like 300 kilometers per hour um this is kind of a stupid scale travel time at 220 miles an hour what what, what? okay like that doesn't help the aquila line in the northeastern corridor it's hardly an effective map of transport solutions and the Aquila line isn't really that fast either. It can reach about 150 miles per hour, but averages less than 70. This is not the case for Europe's insanely well-designed railroad. Well, let me just see real quick. 150 mile per hour to 241. Okay, respectable. But he said it doesn't even stay at that speed. System. And you have to remember that Europe's system accomplishes this while spanning 33 different nations in a very diverse continent. And I know what you're probably thinking. This is just because Europe is smaller than the United States, which simply isn't. I wasn't thinking that. <laughs> I've always thought you're all of Europe. I assume it's a good amount bigger. But I, I don't know for sure. True. While the European Union is smaller than the US. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's a lot smaller. <laughs> Darn. He tricked me. He was like, you probably think it's smaller. It is. Continental Europe has an area that is about 1.04. Oh, well, there you go. He keeps tricking me. This is the European Union. That's not Europe. This is blasphemous. Stop tricking me. I knew Europe was bigger. Actually, it's almost the exact same size. Four times as much as the US. So we can dismiss this argument that the United States can't be that well designed because it's too big. Europe simply is better designed. That would be a really stupid argument. I mean, the more, the bigger it is, the more of a need you have for high speed rail. So it should be better designed if it's bigger, but and it's not. If you're American, you might not understand why railroad tracks or public transport as a whole is so important. I mean, driving a car works fine, right? Well, no, and Europe showcases why a primary focus on private transportation is so detrimental to a well-functioning transit system. Look at these maps. They show the US road network versus the EU's. And as you can see, the EU's road network is not nearly as impressive as the US's. And yet, mm. when you look at some of the most congested cities in the world, European countries don't feature particularly prominently in the global rankings. This is pretty shocking information because you'd assume that the country with a more expansive road network has a lot less congestion, especially considering the United States has devoted lots of time and money to their highways. 
So, how come Europe is less congested when they have... Well, uh, you might have to define exactly what congested means, because congested with people or cars. Fewer roads. Well, it all comes down to disincentivizing the use of cars and, most importantly, making an attractive alternative. Europe does this by having both private and public transportation infrastructure, which technically the US has as well, it's just a lot worse. But on top of this... Yeah, I've never even used a train. I used a subway. Europe makes it pretty expensive to buy, own and use a car. This is achieved by having high taxes on vehicles and gasoline. In fact, the thing is, Europe, I think the entire society is well more, much more well formed to having, you know, like uh, public transport, whereas we'd have to make a lot of drastic changes here in America. We all live in houses that are 10 miles away from the grocery store. And it's mostly just other houses around you. You'd have to walk to get to the train station. You'd have to walk 10 miles. And people wouldn't want the, the train station coming through the neighborhood. Most people in Europe own a car, right, though? Do you, do you ever drive it to the train station? That seems weird. Here's a map of it's more of a city thing. Worldwide gasoline prices. As you can see, European nations are in the top rankings, while the US lies at the bottom, charging very little. But let me be very clear, it's only a good idea to make it expensive to drive a car if you have an attractive alternative. Which America doesn't, but Europe does. I mean, obviously this wouldn't work in the US with its current transportation infrastructure. But in Europe, this is a great strategy, because you make the roads less congested for those who actually need them, and give everyone else an affordable and efficient alternative, being Europe's amazing public. I guess you could ride your bike to the train, but where would you put the bike? Like transport, like the trains on the railways. This is arguably the better strategy because even though the vast majority of Americans have access to vehicles at around 91% and gas is comparatively cheap, it still leaves 9% who don't have access to vehicles. What are these people who can't afford a car supposed to do? They gotta take the bus, and that sucks. I mean, sometimes public transport. But also, a part of that 9% are people who intentionally don't own a car because they live in the middle of Times Square and don't need a car. Isn't even an option or simply too- But probably that's probably a pretty small percentage to be honest. Expensive for many. So you've now actively excluded those who aren't exactly the most well off from society. To make matters worse, some US cities actually got rid of their public transport to make room for more cars. <laughs> I'm not joking. American streetcars like Yikes. trams were actually removed to make way for bigger roads. Absolutely insane. Compare that to Oslo, Berlin and Madrid, where discussions are underway to restrict or even exclude most cars from the city center. And let's not forget that when you have cars, you wow. also need somewhere to park them. And this is- Yeah, that's the thing that sucks about cars. This is where things start to become rather ridiculous. You see, the United States has 2 billion parking spaces for- and then the more parking lots you have, the more distance you have between locations, like between even just shops. So now you need the car just to travel through the parking lots. You have a mile of parking lots to go through to get to, from Walmart to the restaurant, even if it's right next door. For 250 million cars. That's eight parking spaces per vehicle. In Europe, it's pretty much a one-to-one -one with around 250 million public parking spaces for 300 million cars. Wow, that's actually fascinating. That really says a lot. I'm not exactly sure what the exact implications of that, but they're clearly using their parking spaces much more efficiently. And that just means there's a lot less dead space being wasted on parking lot. I mean, the parking lots are huge and usually they're only at 25% occupancy. But to emphasize the ridiculousness of this even further, the area that the US dedicates for car parking is actually larger than the area dedicated for housing people. It's honestly unbelievable that people wow. are being squeezed out of American cities due to regulators wanting to make more room for parking spaces. This simply wouldn't fly in the EU, as it has a whole policy dedicated to improving urban planning. See, the EU spent 115 billion euros between 2014 and 2020 to improve city design by making it smarter, greener, and more connected. 
simply meaning they allocated funds to make their cities more efficient, more connected. Yeah, I don't see any parking garages here. It looks so good. It's very uh, aesthetically just beautiful. And better for the environment. And better for the environment they really are. As the average resident in a typical western US city, such as Los Angeles or Phoenix, contributes approximately six times more carbon to the atmosphere per capita than an average European city resident. This is pure- Sorry. Well, I don't live in the city, so there. Only the results of not having effective transport solutions, which saves resources and allows people to move about efficiently. And exactly that. Moving about efficiently is something most of Europe's citizens are able to do as a result of the European Union. Look at the amount of bikes. I want to see the statistic on that. <laughs> There's just so many more bikes. See, a lot more healthy people. Most of Europe's nations are in the European Union, which gives the EU citizens a number of perks, which includes a free travel area. This has been one of the most important achievements of the EU, as it makes it possible for an EU citizen to travel freely to other EU member states and stay for up to three months. Mm -hmm. All they need is a passport or even just an ID card. No visas, no trips to embassies, no form filing, just head straight over. This makes it incredibly cool. easy to travel, study, and work in other countries and communities. And having this level of centralization... Yeah, it's just interesting to even see areas like this where it's people walking through. There's no cars, there's no... There's no... It's not even a road. It's very important to good design, as it gives the smartest people the opportunity to work where they are most useful. And since good design obviously requires a lot of complicated problem solving and planning, this is very smart. Another smart thing is the incredible biking infrastructure we see in Europe, perfectly illustrated by this map of bike path density in Europe. All the paper lines are bike paths, and there's clearly a lot of them, especially towards the left side of the map. But that's just because this is the home of the Dutch, the Netherlands. Now, the funny thing is, I won't be able to compare this to a map of bike path density in the United States, because such a map hasn't been made. At least I wasn't able to find any, and I can only wonder why. But it's, it doesn't look like that. But anyway, what Europe and also the European Union... That would be a very pitiful map, I'll tell you right now. Most bike paths are just tiny lanes that are sometimes to the side of the road, if you're lucky. You know, if you live in like a nicer area or like a city, you, you can have a bike lane that's, you know, this big and goes right next to all the cars that are going 60 miles an hour. <laughs> ...has achieved is pretty remarkable, as it's hard to think of another set of such diverse countries where you would be able to travel so freely, in an efficient and inexpensive manner. I mean, you can literally get from Paris to Amsterdam, for example, in just three hours for around $30. Imagine being able to travel all over Asia without any border crossings, checks, or visas, and being able to stay for months at a time. That would be truly amazing. And let's not forget that European that camera made me a little seasick. Design has always been distinctive and very successful. In fact, the continent's history of design and interconnectedness serves as a model for the rest of the world. But even though Europe and the EU are pretty great and have amazing infrastructure, they obviously aren't perfect. And I'd love to hear No, they're not. Some of the reasons it might not be, so leave a comment down below if you have some thoughts on this. But that's He's like, they're not perfect. I mean, I don't know any flaws, but I think they're not perfect. They must not be perfect. <laughs> so for this video, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Uh, it looks a lot more homogenous and tightly packed overall. Anyway, that was interesting. Some very interesting stats. Eight times as many parking sp spots per car in America. And there's more parking lot, per, like more square footage of parking lots than houses? I can't, that's, that's mind blowing. I don't even understand. That's ridiculous. You pretty much need a car in America. If you, unless you live right in the city, right in the middle of the city and you can just walk. Other than that, you pretty much need a car. Like I would die if I didn't have a car. I mean, not not actually, but I would probably be in much better shape, which is the opposite of dying. Yeah, I don't know. But my point is I'd have to walk like 10 miles just to get to anything.
if I didn't have a car. And I'm not taking the bus because they're gross. Like, they're actually dirty, the ones around here. Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope you had a fantastic day. And I hope to see you again tomorrow if you feel like it. Because <laughs> I'll be here. You're, you're, you are welcome to come. I'll be here, you know, same time. Okay, uh, goodbye.